We're down to a big topic here. This is this is really the meat of the course in one way. This part I expected, although I must say, this is a resoundingly excellent book. Um, this is the stuff that I've taught it every time I taught this book, is trying to wind windows, and it has new stuff in here more clearly explained than I've seen before. So um, here's the topics for this class and the next class, which will be in two weeks because we have Conrad Rosaria next week. Um, but the NTFS is a big issue. All the information stored in the NTFS uh, file format. Uh, prefetch is a small issue, and event logs are a small issue, and scheduled tasks are a pretty small issue, but they're worth knowing. And there are places where, especially malware, hides to make it restart every time you restart the machine. And next time we'll do the registry and these other things after there, because there's enough, half of this is enough for one night. And NTFS is most of it. So you've now done the project where you dug through the NTFS data runs with WinHex, and you've got to see how it looks um, at one level. And this is more information about some of the things that I didn't understand in that WinHex project. So fat, originally there was FAT, which was a simple file allocation table. It just had a flat file, and it had, I think, 64 bytes per file, a very small amount of record for each file. And that was, um, and basically that ended with Windows 98 or Windows ME, Microsoft abandoned it, and they switched to the new technology file system in 1993. And there have been very minor changes in it, but they're still using it. It's the basic file system for almost all Windows servers, except for fault-tolerant servers that are now using uh, ReFS, supposedly, although I don't know how many people are actually using it. Anyway, this is based on the master file table. Instead of the file allocation table, this thing called the master file table is there, and this determines what clusters are used to store the contents of what files, and how all the files and folders fit together in a tree store. And it stores all the metadata, like creation times and permissions on the files. So that's the master file table. Uh, this has all the timestamps, the size, permissions, parent directory, and information about the contents. Every NTFS volume has a master file table. This is part of the overhead. In that project, you may have noticed you have a 100 meg disk. When you format it NTFS, you only have about 70 megs you can use, because the rest of it's used for overhead. And this is the overhead, the master file table, and a few other things like the journal and the page file and such. So this is stored in the root of the drive as MFT, but you can't see it anywhere in the Windows API. You are not supposed to mess with it, so it's hidden even more than, say, hidden system files. It's hidden in a way that no, in the Explorer process is not allowed to see it because they really don't want you deleting it or renaming it or messing with it. But you can, if you have raw disk access, like looking at a forensic disk image with a forensic tool, you can see it, and that's where it is. Um, so. On a standard hard drive with 512-byte sectors, which is still the most common, um, these things are 1,024 bytes each. And this every file and directory has one such entry, and that's enough to store all the information you need, which is kind of interesting to me. And that kind of means, I guess, if you started adding more and more permissions until you had 1,000 lines of permissions, you'd run out of room. It'd be sort of fun to try that and see what happens. Anyway. Um, there's the, so the first 16 entries are essential NTFS artifacts, and you saw them. If you remember this uh, project you did, you see these things here. Here's the MFT, and here's log file, and booted, bitmap, and bad cluster, and so on. These are things that start with dollars, are all these magic hidden files that are used to keep track of how the disk is being used. All right. Um, so you have a record type file or directory, just like you would have in Linux. Everything starts with a D or a dash. You'd have a record number, which is like the inode number in Linux. All right. And uh, then it restores the parent record number here, which is kind of a problem. This is, it is a, you can see it in Windows Explorer, you have dot and dot dot in every folder, which is you know where the folder is and you know what the parent folder is. But if you have a tree structured directory, it could take a long time to traverse all that to build the directory. So there's a special index record to make the traversal faster. Otherwise, it would be very inefficient to search through the files. Then there's active, inactive flag. This is the only thing that changes when you delete a file. It marks the record inactive. Does not erase anything right away, which surprised me because I'd heard that you could never recover metadata for a deleted file. In practice, you usually can't because it's overwritten very rapidly. But in principle, there could be a file that's been deleted. If someone deleted a file and then immediately shut down the machine, there would be something left here. Uh, there would be metadata for some of the deleted files, but not very many. Anyway. Um, so here's how it looks, a, uh, a record. You've got a record header, then you've got standard information, file name, and then data runs here. Information about the data. And so like if you delete a file, all it does is mark the master file table inactive, and it doesn't erase it. 
But as soon as any new file is created, it will try to reuse existing MFT records as much as possible before creating new ones. So in practice, if it's on the system drive, the background processes windows are constantly creating files and erasing files. So within a few seconds or minutes, you'll lose the metadata when you delete a file. Uh, you won't lose the contents of the file. Those are out in the clusters. You might not lose them for months because you actually, that'll only depend if you're actually saving enough new data to actually fill up a part of the disk. But the metadata is relatively volatile. Um, this is something, uh, there are, they call this the MACE timestamps. There are four different timestamps on every file, only three of which you can see from inside Windows. Uh, modified, accessed, created, and entry modified, which is a little confusing. Um, and not only that, there's two sets of them. So there are eight timestamps on every file because the standard information has the four timestamps and the file name has the four timestamps. Now, under normal conditions, they will both be the same, but if someone has been attempting to alter the timestamps, they might not be the same. And that's why a forensic investigator is probably the only person who would actually want to look at all these different times. Because um, if the criminal is sloppy about deleting files, they leave evidence of the file behind, and if they're sloppy about forging times, they leave evidence behind. It shows this time has been messed with. So um, here's the standard information timestamps. That's what you see if you do the properties of a file or folder in Windows. You see three timestamps on here, created, and I know someplace there's more. I'm not seeing them all in this thing, but there's a created, there's modified, and accessed. Those are the three you can normally see. The entry modified thing is not here. That's when the metadata was modified, the MFT itself. And so forensic tools will show all four timestamps. However, and here they are again, the entry modified is when the MFT itself was changed. And these others are pretty obvious. Um, created is when the file was first created. Accessed is when it was last read. And modified is when it was last changed. However, um, accessed doesn't work anymore. Microsoft, ever since Windows XP, Microsoft decided it's a waste of time to keep track of when something was accessed as opposed to when it was modified. So they don't bother to update it. Uh, it might never update at all, or it might update it with a delay of up to an hour. Because they've just decided it's a waste of time to bother keeping track of that timestamp. So that data is less reliable than it used to be. Anyway, um, so here's the M NTFS um, file name timestamps. And there's even more than you might think here. See, the file name is actually a mess in Windows. Originally in DOS, you could only have eight letters, then a dot, and three more letters. That was it. And then they invented long file names in like Windows 95, but they didn't actually implement a file system that handled long file names. It really uses an 8.3 file name, and it uses a bunch of them adding up to make this long name. Um, so it has at least two kinds of names stored for every file. And actually, many command line commands, at least in the Windows command line interpreter, default to the MS 8.3. So there are some hilarious conditions under which you do bulk operations with like a couple letters star, and you end up changing totally the wrong files because it actually runs by the 8.3 name instead of by the long name. Um, there are a lot of little, there are a lot of uh, appendices in Windows that are left over from the ancient times of MS-DOS. But anyway, uh, the time stomping is the process of trying to hide your tracks by changing times. And there are various stomping tools out there that hackers use to try to hold them. And so these will try to change the timestamps. Now, if these tools run from inside Windows, then the only one they can change are the first three. They can't see the last one. You can't read it and you can't write it from a Windows application through an API call. So um, there are tools like SetMace that use tricks to get around that. I think by starting services to come around. Um, and so SetMace you can download here, and it does a more thorough job of stomping timestamps. Um, another thing that uh, malware does frequently, if you install malware, what it will, you know, you're all, if you're Windows 2008, all your files were created in like 2007. Then you install new files, and they're created in 2015, so they stand right out. So what malware will do is it will copy the timestamp from a system file, so it appears to be the same time as all your system files uh, years ago to try to hide. And that, and, but if it doesn't do it right, it won't get all the timestamps, and you'll see inconsistencies like this. And this is a real example from, a, from the textbook. Um, this thing claims to have been created in 2006, but the file name was created in 2009 because they stopped this, but the stomping tool didn't manage to stop the second bunch of timestamps. So that's why it's really important. I know one of the cases that my favorite teacher, Steve Haley, did. Um, there was a Japanese teacher in high school who was accused of being a pedophile because they said he was downloading porn on one of the classroom machines and it appeared to have child porn on it. And so they accused him of this. He was kicked out of his church, fired, blacklisted as a sex criminal, all before even going to court. And then um, it was one of his students that investigated it and found the evidence that led to this. And then he, Steve, reviewed the evidence and found that the clock had been altered and his students had failed to notice that. 
And in fact, he was not even in the country when the events occurred, and he figured out who it was. It was a different teacher, and then went to the supervisor of the school who said, oh, he's gone too far, we'll just continue prosecuting the wrong guy. So he managed to go over their head and get this reversed. But there's, that guy can never teach again. I mean, once you have this thread, if your thread of sexism and racism touches you, then you're tainted forever, whether it's true or not. Um, anyway, and so it is very common that criminals change timestamps and they change the clock. And if you don't watch for it, you can easily end up misinterpreting your evidence and convicting the wrong person. Uh, there is a very thorough document here, the SANS poster that has many listed Windows artifacts. It goes on and on. It's really quite cool, and it's nice cheese cheat. So it's a fun thing to see. It has many, right? it even has a cool section on how to find unknown malware. So it's very nice, a thing worth, I'm not expecting you to memorize all this stuff, but it's a good reference work when you're doing things. Um, all right, I got a few eye clicker questions. Come get one if you need one. If you can't find any in the, there's uh, more layers below. And I've got a driver's license. Aha. Chow Zoom. That's you. Uh, just use a piece of paper. Don't use the driver's license. It's uh, some student may take it. Let me just pass it back to you. Okay. Students do take each other's cards out of there and. Uh, I don't have any way to prevent that. Don't put anything in there that's valuable. All right. Anyway, so uh, let's find the eye clicker thing. There it is. Okay. Like a course. Oh, there's a layer one problem. 